Elaine and I were gone the first part of this week. We had to attend a funeral of one of my cousins that passed away. <clears throat> and uh, we're all from down home. But he lived in Greenwood, Indiana. <clears throat> and when we lived down home, his family never darkened the church door. And I always wondered about that because now they're scattered all over. But when I went to his funeral the other day, I found out that he was a devout Christian. And I thought, glory to God, because he can do anything. And I've heard, uh, I heard Beverly and, and some others talk about the love of God. And that's what happens. God's love comes in and takes control. And I want to speak a little bit about that. Romans, the fifth chapter, verses one through eight. And let's just pray over the word. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the Spirit of God that is dwelling right here, walking about in us, giving us strength, giving us peace, and we're enjoying it, Father. Thank you so much. Bless this word that it go forth from this place by your people, that it bless others also in Jesus' name. Amen. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we also have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we also glory in tribulations. See, 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, In everything give thanks. Because Jesus said, we'll have tribulation. We'll have problems that come against us. Knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, translated spiritual knowledge and power. That word there, of course, strength means you have power. If you don't have strength, you're weak. But in this case right here, it's without spiritual knowledge and power. For when we were yet without spiritual knowledge and power, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare die. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want to speak about the four words that have caused a change in your life and mine. Those four words are love, faith, wisdom, and grace. I think it was David Jeremiah that told a story concerning these four words. It seems the devil had challenged God to a baseball game and the winner would take over all the world. Now we know that's not a true story. But anyway, the bottom of the ninth inning, the score was tied. In order not to go into extra innings, the Lord pondered his batting order. Suddenly he calls love to the plate. 
The devil's pitcher delivered the first pitch, a fastball right down the middle. Love swings and hits a single. Now love's on first. Next, God calls for faith, who bends out over the plate and readies his swing. The curveball moves a little outside and faith cracks a single, moving love to second. The next batter is wisdom. The next four pitches were all balls and wisdom never moved the bat from his shoulders. How many of us knew it took wisdom to play sports? I must not have had wisdom enough to play sports. Of course, I was a little bitty guy at that time. Now we have love on third, faith on second, and wisdom on four, on first. Who to call next that would score the winning run? He motions for grace to grab his bat. And as the first pitch comes across the plate, Grace smashes a grand slam to right field and the devil goes down in disgrace. There was a reporter there and he was, he comes around and he asks the Lord, why did you have the batting order chose this way? Well, said the Lord, love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 8 says prophecies will fail, tongues will fail, knowledge will vanish, but God is love and he is eternal. Faith works by love. Galatians 5, 6 for in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, but faith worketh by love. I've never really taken time to look into the love of God. What is there about you and I that causes God to pour out such tremendous love toward his creatures? Do you realize that Christianity is the only religion that sets forth a supreme being as love? The gods of the heathen are angry, hateful beings in constant need of being appeased. In 1 John 4, 8 through 16, we note that God is love, God is light, God is spirit. The fact that God is love, spirit, and light are all expressions of God's essential nature. Love is the expression of his personality that corresponds to his nature. That is, it's the nature of God to love. For me to define or describe the love of God is extremely difficult and close to, if not impossible. How can we explain? How many hours in the day would it take us to explain the love of God? We can talk about God being love. We can read it in the Word that God is love. But how do you explain? You might have a testimony about His love. We all should have a testimony about His love. When we read in 1 John 3.16 or John 3.16, it states that the love of God is of such a nature that he is constantly showing his interest in the physical and spiritual welfare of his children. This tends to lead him to make sacrifices beyond human understanding that reveals his great love. In John, 1 John 1, in 1 John 3.16, I want to read that. Here's 
Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Of course, you know John 3.16, for he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That love seems to compel him to endure all the pain and suffering to show that love and bring you and I into constant communion with him. We may note also that the object of that love is almost exclusively human. Jesus Christ, God's only begotten, only born Son, is the special object of that love. In Matthew 3.17 we read, After the baptism of, of Jesus by John in the Jordan, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In Matthew 17, 5 and Luke 20, verse 13, this son shares the love of the Father in a unique sense, just as he is the Son in a unique sense. While Peter yet spoke, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son whom I am well pleased, hear him, hear him. In Luke 20, 13, it is this, well-beloved son that the father is willing to send to bring other children into the family through spiritual adoption by his son. It isn't hard to understand how this son who did the will of his father so perfectly should become the special object of that love. Knowing that God's love is eternal, we are also aware that such love must have had an eternal object to love. God is eternal. Jesus Christ is eternal. In John 16, 17, Jesus said this, For the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and believe that I came out from God. John 14, 21 through 23, Jesus declared, He that loves me shall be loved to my Father, If a man loves me, my father will love him. Jesus did testify in in, uh, John 17, 23, as he was testifying to the father, you have loved them as you have loved me. I want to turn over there to John 17. Okay, I know where it's at. (laughs) Well, I should have. I had it marked with my little tape. (laughs) He's praying. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. And he's praying for those that... God had given him while he was here on this earth. And he says, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. 
Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And in verse 17, he's praying, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. They're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And he goes on to say down lower, Neither pray I for these alone. Here's where you come in. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Jesus prayed for you before he ever left the earth. That's the love of God. That they may all be one as thou, Father, are in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. He goes in verse 23, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Jesus declared, He that loved me shall be beloved of my Father. And if a man loves me, my Father will love him. If we really believe these words, we're not on the outskirts of that love, but in the very midst of it. It's like Jesus is standing there right in the very middle of the circle of God's love. He then draws us to that spot and disappears, leaving us standing there bathed in the same loving kindness of the Father in which He Himself has always basked. Jesus said, I will manifest Myself to you. However, before we start to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, don't forget that John 3.16 states that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. How many does He desire to love in 2 Peter 3.9? 3, uh, 3, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. That's how many He seeks to love but that all should come to repentance. According to Romans 5.8, everyone in this room were at one time part of John 3.16 and 2 Peter 3.9. We were all part of the world. William Evans stated, the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind. In 1 Timothy 2, 1, 3, and 4 we read, I exhort therefore that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. We should be praying that all men come to the glory of God. Hell wasn't made for people. Hell was made for the devil and his angels. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. God says all men could be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Over there in John 17, 17, it said, Sanctify them by your truth. Thy word is truth. The word was made flesh and dwelled among men, and they beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. We may note the love of God in three ways. First, 1 John 4, 9 and 10 relates, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. We have to live through Him. Because over there in John, the 17th chapter, He was praying for all of those that will come into the kingdom from the word that the, the apostles preached. 
because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice. He's the atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, everything has always had to have a sacrifice to be approved of God. You know, in the Old Testament, it was the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer and those things. And then when Christ came, that's the reason he came to give his life and shed his blood because he loved us and sent his son. The cross of Calvary is the highest expression of the love of God for sinful man. Secondly, we enjoy the complete pardon through the love of God for all our sins that we have committed and will commit. In Isaiah 38, 17, the prophet records, Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but you have in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins behind your back to remember them no more. That's a great promise. I will remember your sins no more. That's my love that I have for those that I created that come to me through the blood of my son. In Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, Paul recorded, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us. Even when we were dead in sins, has quickened or made us alive because we were dead in our sin, and he made us alive together with Christ. In the first three verses of this chapter, we note the condition. Let's look at that. Ephesians 2 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he hath loved us. But God reverses the curse of death by making us alive through his love by Jesus Christ. Not only are we forgiven, but he has made a position for us in his heavenly kingdom. Even in the old covenant, we read in Isaiah 63, Nine, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them in his love and in his pity. He redeemed them and bore them and carried them all the days of old. The third thing of the note is the fact because of his great love, he remembers all his children in all of the varying circumstances of life. All of the circumstances of life. In everything, give thanks unto God. All the circumstances of your life. In Isaiah 49, 15 and 16, God asked the prophet, Can a woman forget her suckling child? that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. 
Yes, they may forget. Yet I will not forget you. Behold, I have graven you upon the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Can you imagine your name engraven in the palm of God's hands? Because he forgets no one. Remember our text, hope makes not a shame because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. I want to leave you with this. The evidence of God's great love is this, that He has engraven us on the palms of His own hands, so that he can never forget us. The scars in his hands are ever before his eyes as a reminder of the great love he has showered on us and his desire to care for us. Amen.